so this is a bit of an interesting talk, and I'm giving it at a bit of an interesting time. And it's a little bit strange. I feel a little bit like an imposter standing here because I am not an SRE. I am a data scientist. Uh, there are very few scenarios where you would need to call in a data scientist at 3 in the morning, and most of them involve a stranded spaceship on the way to the moon. But in addition to a data scientist, I am also a transgender woman, and I am an activist. And this talk came as a result of behavior that I observe when people talk to me and when people try to give me compliments and when people engage with me, where they say very frequently, oh, you're so brave, you're so strong. And over the past year, I've been thinking a lot about what it means to be brave, what it means to be strong, and how that changes how we are in the workplace and how we interact with each other in the workplace. So a lot of this talk is a talk about my personal experiences and how I cannot remove them from what I do as a professional. But what I really want to do is frame how the language of strength, the language of heroism, doesn't just affect those who are marginalized, those who uh, work second shift labor in activism or in uh, whatever else it might be, but how that language affects us and what the expectations are of us as workers every day. Uh, so I will be around to take questions. I'm going to try and keep this short, try to get you to lunch on time. Um, so if you want to ask me questions, please feel free to approach me uh, after this talk. A few content warnings on this. This is going to be a difficult talk for a few reasons. Um, I'm going to provide some examples of, of workplace racism, sexism, uh, ableism. And there's going to be some disturbing images, because in addition to being a data scientist and an activist, I'm also from the United States, where I live in Charlottesville, Virginia. And if you have paid attention to the news, you might know that a few weeks ago we had a pretty dramatic scenario in Charlottesville. I am also definitely going to swear during this talk. It is impossible for me not to, um, if for other, no other reason that some of the examples that I have to provide have that language in it. So what do I mean when I talk about strength culture? I talk about strength as the sacrifice, the emphasis on sacrifice as a virtue, but not just a virtue, but as a quality, something, a trait that we look for in employees, similar to a bias towards action or problem-solving ability. We often expect people, particularly in SRE, to have this level of self-sacrifice that they are expected to perform. It also is the practice of overvaluing exceptionalism. We look to heroes to set standards for us, and we put upon them this virtue of strength, this virtue of bravery, this virtue of being a badass. But it's also the empty praise of everyday acts by people who have different marginalizations in their life. It could be disability. It could be mental health. It could be you just went through a breakup, or a partner lost a job, or a, ch a child is sick. These are things that matter and affect how we act in the workplace, and we have to factor that in to how we communicate in the workplace. So I'll provide a few examples that will probably be fairly familiar. These are real life examples. This one, Adi is so brave to be the only black person in the company. Adi doesn't want to be the only black person in the company. Adi doesn't want to be brave for being the only black person in the company. Adi probably wants more black people to work with her. Or this one, this is another real life example. Can you believe Kelly has to walk up two flights of stairs with her prosthetics? She's such an inspiration. Kelly doesn't want to be your inspiration. She wants you to install a damn elevator. <laughs> Moreover, she wants you to put your voice, your status on the line to get that elevator installed. And this is a pretty familiar one to me because this is something that somebody actually tweeted at me. At Emily Gorsensky, wow, mad props for having the guts to be who you are. Hashtag applause. Why does me existing have to be something that takes guts? Why do I have to be brave just to go about doing my thing? This is a workplace example. This is something that uh, I've encountered in my career when at my last job, where I worked for eight years at a small business with 30 employees. 
as a trans woman, I transitioned on the job. And when I transitioned, a lot of people there said, wow, you're so brave, you're so strong, I'm so proud of you for being who you are and doing this. We are here to support you. And six months later, when a manager continued to use deliberately my old name, my old pronouns, I asked politely for that to stop. And when it didn't, I filed a formal complaint, as is my right. And this is the response that he sent. Emily, we have not experienced the burden or pressures you may feel in regard to your gender identity, and it would not be surprising if they color your perception of others' actions or ideas. In other words, it's my fault that he was an asshole, and I was seeing it wrong. And when I told him that I was going to leave because of this response, he said, well, you just have to be more, more brave. You just have to be stronger, as if it was his assessment of how brave I needed to be. This is strange because a few days or a few months prior, all I heard was how brave I was for transitioning on, in, in the job. I was praised for being strong, but when it became inconvenient for them, I wasn't strong enough. And this dichotomy is precisely the problem that we encounter when we talk about working conditions. If we are the person that is the sole responder to a complex incident, we get all sorts of praise on how awesome we are, how good we did at solving that problem. But as soon as we start saying, hey, I think this on-call rotation is broken and I want you to fix it, all of a sudden, well, maybe you just need to tough it out more. How tough do we have to be? How many braveries do I need for my manager to not be an asshole? The truth is, that strength is a tax that we pay with emotional labor all the time. It's OK to have to be strong sometimes. It's OK to have to sacrifice sometimes. Complex situations require deep problem-solving capabilities. I'm not saying that being strong is a poor thing to be. What I am saying is that we need to recognize that when we demand strength out of people, they are paying with more than just the work that they're doing. There's a compounding cost to having to stand up. And I saw this, because this is what Charlottesville looked like on August 11th. And I'm in this picture to the left from your perspective of the statue. I was one of 30 people who stood around that statue while 300 men with torches, wearing swastikas, shouting, Heil Hitler, surrounded us. Those people that were there with me were students, 20 years old, 19 years old, community members. There was a person there who linked arms in a wheelchair. And when they attacked us, they poured lighter fluid on us and then swung torches. One of them maced us. I have seen what actual bravery is. And I have seen what it takes. And when we demand bravery of people in the workplace, we are not demanding bravery. We are demanding them to do free work. So let's talk about the workplace. This is actually not my workplace. That's actually New Relic. Um, but I work across the river from, from this. This is Portland. I work remotely. Um, let's talk about how we deal with things in the industry when we, when we talk about strength. And I want to provide a few takeaways so that we can learn how to reframe the language that we use, but not just the language, the actions. When we praise strength, what we're actually doing is we're taking away from work accomplishments and experiences and skills. So the example I like to use is this uh, woman, Farida Bedway. Does anyone know who Farida Bedway is? Has anyone ever heard of her? She is a Ghanaian founder and programmer working in micropayments. She's built a cloud-based cloud platform for micro-lending in Ghana. And if you know anything about payments, I, I work in the financial industry as a data scientist. If you know anything about payments, Africa, in particular Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, have some of the most advanced payment systems, mobile, mobile payment systems in the world. They blow away almost everything that we have in Europe and the United States. She's a founder in this space. 
She also has cerebral palsy. And so she does her work despite a disability, a physical disability. And when she was profiled by CNN, did they focus on her, the fact that she's a founder in one of the most cutting edge industries in one of the most rapidly growing markets in the world? No, they say, Bedouin has steadfastly refused to let her disability affect her career trajectory. We can't even talk about people who have disability, who have marginalizations, without centering those marginalizations and taking away from the actual skills that they have. The second takeaway is the converse of this, that when we don't see those marginalizations, when we don't see those deficiencies that somebody might have in their ability to do, to, to sacrifice, we don't give them credit for it. Uh, James, who, who started your first PR, who's a fantastic person, says, uh, if somebody tells you that they are depressed, the worst thing you can do is say, why, you're doing so well. This is not the kind of behavior, this is not helpful to discredit what they have to do. So strength in this sense is something that we're not assigning. We only assign it to the, to the virtues that we want to assign it to, not to the virtues that are required. And so that becomes a real issue when we go into workplace culture. And this is the third takeaway. And this is where it becomes really relevant to recent um, incidents in the tech industry. That we have this culture of hero worship in technology, and that heroism is only achievable through sacrifice. You have to be the person that is able to handle the complex incident all by yourself. You have to be the, the open source uh, uh, rock star, to use a terrible term. And when we don't have, when people aren't that, rather than saying, rather than recognizing that they're just a normal person doing normal work, we decide to say that they're not strong enough. Oh, you're not strong enough because you didn't spend your weekends and nights learning a new language or a new technology. We assign a deficit of strength when we want to find it, when somebody is inconvenient to us, say you're not strong enough. Ash Dryden, who uh, started AlterConf, who runs AlterConf, and is somebody that I have the great privilege of calling a friend, wrote that we all want a system where we feel we can be rewarded for what we contribute. And society's injustice towards certain groups of people, most specifically geeks, many of us who grew up feeling abused, persecuted, and ignored would be rendered irrelevant. In striving for that, our community has become a microcosm of society at large. And this is exactly the case that we saw with the James Damore memo. In our push to disrupt society, we have managed to completely replicate all of its anti-patterns. When we create heroes, when we create a value structure that causes us to demand sacrifice out of people, all we have done is replicate all of the wrongs that we have in the society at large, not just inheriting them, but using our stature and our wealth in the tech industry to compound them even more than they are in the real world. And these are interesting dynamics because in this, there was uh, this headline from Breitbart, social justice warrior backlash against Google Saffer, I would beat the shit out of him. Because the dynamics of our industry are not different than the dynamics of the culture at large. And this is what it breeds. Does anyone know who said this, by the way? My bad. Sorry. Um, so co consider this an apology to Liz and to all of the Google uh, engineers whose lives I made more difficult. All right, so let's take a, a cute animal break real quick. Um, there's, a, there's one more takeaway that I want to I want to give, and this is the most important one, because I've talked about strength in terms of people who are marginalized, people who are you know, disabled or, or or have mental illness or uh, other such things. But I want to make it clear that I'm not trying to preach social justice here. I'm trying to preach a way for us to take control of our workplaces and make our own lives better. Overemphasizing extraordinary acts of sacrifice makes them normal. And when we require them 
and we expect people to commit extraordinary sacrifice, and I'm not talking about, you know, sure, you have a release, you're going to have a long night, right? That's fine. I have no issue with that. I'm talking about when it becomes a weekly, bi-weekly pattern. If your process requires that kind of sacrifice on a regular basis, your process sucks, and your managers need to be fired. Because this is not sustainable, healthy behavior. We can't keep building an industry where we are expecting 80 to 100 hours of labor out of people just to be considered normal. And this is where we're at, or at least this is where we are very close to heading. A little while back, Alice Goldfuss wrote in a blog post, No More On-Call Martyrs, that there is a cult of masochism around on-call, a pride in the pain and of the conquering of the rotating gauntlet. She says that sleepless nights are expected and almost heralded, Every on-call sysadmin has war stories to share. Calling them war stories is part of the pride. She says that this is the language of the disenfranchised. That term, war stories, war room, this tells us everything we need to know about how toxic this culture is. Because we're not at war. We're not at war. We're building systems. We're building amazing systems. We're building world-scale systems, but it's not war. War stories is more than toxic. It's actually dishonest. Because what we should be doing is not seeking to create more war stories. We should be seeking to create fewer wars. And I've seen that. And when, I usually, when I've given this talk before, I like to say we're not warriors. And this is a really weird thing for me to say. Because that's me with the striped shirt and the blue backpack. And my hand is here because I'm reholstering the gun that I pulled when we were attacked on that street by James Fields. This is what war looks like. And you don't want to be part of this. And you don't want to glorify this. And when I say that strength is a tax paid in emotional labor, I'm saying that all of these people that you see in this frame are the people that ran towards the attacker not knowing if he was going to come back for a second pass. We need to take this language of war out because this is what it comes to. We use strength to elevate our peers, not just ourselves, but the people we're around, the people that we admire, to the status of heroes. We put on them a heroism that we think that our industry demands. Our industry does not demand heroism. Our industry demands performance. We don't need rock stars. We just need to do our jobs. And we need to be justly compensated for our jobs. And we need to have the proper support to do our jobs. Because at the end of the day, most of us, some of us might be founders, but most of us are just workers trying to make a paycheck. Many of us making very good paychecks. But these expectations of strength compel us to do things and perform free labor. And this is not right. Because the people who can't perform free labor are not given the recognition that they deserve. And the people who can are burnt out or are burning out. And it's not fair to continue to try to elevate people into the 1% and the 0.1%, because that 0.1% doesn't actually sustain our industry. We actually need the bulk of our industry to be capable of solving problems, to be capable of delivering solutions. And this doesn't do us any credit. And so I want to end here with a call to action. I don't normally put this in, but um, having seen heroism, actual heroism in action on the, that street. Knowing, going into the summer, that I was not going to walk out of August 12th with all of the people that I walked into it with. I want to do what Heather Heyer's mother said, and that is to amplify her voice, to magnify it, in her death. Heather was a wobbly. 
She was there because her, for her, the path to social justice was marching with the international workers of the world. She thought that labor rights were the most important thing uh, to bring justice to the world. And this is something important for us in our industry. Uh, many of you might be from com countries that have uh, tech labor unions, and some of you may not be. And so, in her honor, my call to action is for you to start talking to your coworkers, to your peers, about organizing. Whether that means forming a union, helping other people form unions, forcing better working conditions, demanding just pay for the time that you spend on call, for the time that you spend learning outside of your working, whatever it might be, push towards that. Because even if you don't require the benefits of that, there are people around you who will. And that is true strength. And if you want to have an actual war story, get out there and march. Thank you.